decided about this meal that you wanted to do this today? Because mm, it's a staple, especially for people who are trying to cook in minimal circumstances or you've got you know, a kid going to college or whatever, what can they actually create for themselves to, to just get a baseline, something that's really easy to whip up and it's really awesome. <laughs> so it, it, it goes, into, <clears throat> goes into how to build flavor and, and sort of the simple way of building flavor. Right, right. And it's so fast and it's so easy. The hardest part about it is boiling water. Oh, you know, oh. it's just so easy. Awesome. All right. All right, let's so I'm do it. I'm going to haul things out of my fridge. Um, this is actually garlic in olive oil. That when I have when I have a windfall of garlic, I I'm going to do that with it. I'm not, I'm not going to take a chance on them spoiling. So you just what do you do to do that? <clears throat> I take the garlic and I take off the skins. I peel it, cut it in half. Put it in a jar, top it with some good olive oil. Really? That's and it, it just stays like that? Well, not only that, it's just that when you grab some of the oil, the oil, of course, smells Oops. like garlic. So you get to smell it. Oh, wow. So that's kind of mashed in there, though, right? Not so much. It could be, <clears throat> but I didn't. I just cut them in half and threw them in there. Wow. That's amazing. I don't have fresh sweet peppers, but I do have frozen ones, so that's what that's about. Oh. I didn't I know you could freeze them. Yeah, and I have some uh, rice pasta. Awesome. Yeah. Something with rice pasta, it really is excellent. But sometimes that when it's cooking, it smells a little strange. Not to be alarmed, that's just, sometimes that's just rice pasta. Oh. But in almost every way, it responds just as mu as well as, as, a, as a wheat pasta. You yeah, I... It doesn't matter what noodle you use. Oh, okay. uh, I have a thing about noodles. Um, is here I have a, a ramen style that you just boil up. I have pad thai noodles, oh. rice based noodles, and they are, they have that right texture for pad thai. Um, I do have basic yeast pasta. I also have, um, vermicelli noodles. I also have a what's called glass noodle, which is a, made from sweet potatoes, like sweet really? potato starch, and it's really nice. I have a buckwheat soba. Mm. So if I was making, say, that Asian salad that I made for you with the noodles, the, the buckwheat is a really nice choice for that. If that's a because it has flavor of its own kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's very unique. So there's lots of different things that you can use. One of my one of my favorite things is um, is that these packets are pretty cheap, mm -hmm. and even if you like, there's flavoring inside and oil. A little packet of oil. I don't use the oil. I want to use fresh oil. I want to use my oil. But the flavor packet is good, and Thai Kitchen's pretty clean. But anytime you want to grab some noodles, or even just half the amount of noodles in here, you just want it. These you just really have to soak. Mm, you can right. add, you know, slowly boil them, but they're going to cook rather fast. And you want to grab them before they're fully soft because they'll soften in the dish that cooks so fast. So there's really, so you don't have to make it complicated. You could put the noodles in a thermos, pour boiling water on it, let it sit, just keep checking them to make sure, you know, maybe it's going to take 15 minutes, but, you know, keep checking them. So there's no reason not to be able to do this with, you know, think of your a kid in a dorm. What have they got? They can, they can... Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 they can do this without burning the house down. Totally. So as long as they have a kettle and a thermos, <clears throat> they can make something. Or if we're just busy and we just need something nutritious and delicious. and not, Yeah. You know. I have to say that I, I, I don't know what, it, I don't cook for entertainment. I know that a lot of people do and, and, that, and, the, and that's really heavily marketed as well. I don't cook for entertainment. I cook for health and I, I Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I don't have a, a big attention span when it comes to cooking, so everything that I'm doing is pretty quick. I, I, I want it, I'm hungry, I'm going to make something from scratch, I'm going to eat it, and then that's done, and then I can get on to the rest of my life. But I don't want to eat something that's crappy, but 
I prefer to eat something crappy tasting that's healthy than something that tastes like a party. Mm -hmm. If I have my choice, because because my homemade food, as much as it might be boring one day, um, maybe I just saute up some stuff like whatever I've got. It might be boring. I try to add odds and sauce, but sometimes it's just boring. But it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to throw me off track. Well, that, actually, that's what I really like about this is because for me, growing up, maybe it was me growing up in the 70s or whatever, that fast food, like not fast food like you would buy out there, but instant food, it's instant. It's you just put the pack in the microwave and it's done. There's like zero help. And so what I like about what you're doing is it's not zero work right? But it's not hard either. Like, and that's what I love. It's kind of like demystifying. It's like, no, it actually can be really simple. Yeah. And cause even like, since we've started doing these, I'm like, oh yeah, I could just put some veg here and just put some olive oil and oh, it's actually really easy. Okay. And it might take five minutes. But here's the thing. If you have real food, oh, if you have real, f <laughs> if you have real food, from very well balanced and nourished ground, which varies depending on what you're growing in it. Right. Right. Different things like different things. So if you have nourished ground, you not only do you have a nutrient complement inside that fruit or vegetable, you have flavor. Mm -hmm. And so there's certain things you can do to really enhance flavor. For example, if if you want herbs that have flavor, put them in meager ground, and they'll have more flavor. Or if you give them all the goodies, you know, the peat moss and the manure and all that stuff, they will flourish, but they, you won't get the flavor, you won't get the taste. Really? It's kind of meant to be, well, you think of, you know, things, oregano grown in Greece, it needs to struggle a little. Why is that? Why does it taste better in meager ground? Don't know, it just does. So the wow. golden rule is if you're planting herbs for flavor, and kind of figure out what you're planting and figure out what they need to get the most amount of wow. a little bit to it. Also, if you're getting really real vegetables, like real food, you're going to have flavor. You don't have to, you don't have to play it up to get mm -hmm. the flavor. It mm -hmm. has flavor. I remember having a, a guest in my home, and, um, and 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 she took a. I was cooking with carrots from my garden share, from my, from my community supported garden, and. And she took a, she grabbed a, a piece and was chewing on it. And she, she, she lifted it up. She says, oh my God, this tastes like a real carrot. <laughs> totally. Right? So there, there is a difference. Like if you have real food with real flavor, you don't have to constantly be pushing something with adding spices or herbs or whatever. You can complement with those things and you can in increase health with those things. But you're not depending on all the add-ins to give flavor. Right, right. It's, it's just not, not necessary. It has flavor. So about maybe two years ago, something in my brain just switched. And I, I can't say my style of cooking. Like this is, these are notes from when I taught cooking. Mm. This, is, this is from my, and so what I'm doing isn't all that different, but there was something, a little switch in my head that just went, okay, we really need to be thinking about food for survival. Mm. We, we, recognizing that the food industry is, is the same companies as the, as the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and so as much as I could say, I, I can't say that I would never do a drug because I've done one in 36 years, well, 38 years now. I can't say I would never do it, but, but it's a pretty drastic last resort. But it's there. Like antibiotics, not cocaine. Well, to me, just it's kind saying. of, yeah, just saying, no, 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 and, and so, but some people are really more friendly towards drugs, that's the medicine system, but I haven't, that's not my medicine system. Right. So, so recognizing that the same dollar driven industry is in both camps, mm -hmm. you kind of look at it and you say, one of these camps is supposed to make you ill and depleted. And one of the arms of the same industry is supposed to have the cure. Mm. And you look at that scenario and you go, wait a minute. Mm. What would it be like to not have the depletion? Mm -hmm. then, then, So the, the food ends up being the foundation. So even say you're going to be using natural supplements, even the best of them, are they really going to make up for that state of depletion? Right. Or that high level of toxicity? Or goodness knows what they might put in the food now mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know so you kind of look at it and say I'm, I'm kind of not feeling comfortable 
eating food that I can't figure out is pedigree. Right, right. Because I don't know what they've done with it. Even to the point where I'm ready to ask one of the meat suppliers that that I might indulge in, are they, are they, what are they injecting in their animals? Like, what are mm -hmm. they actually using? You know, what kind of food are they using? You just want more information. Mm -hmm. In a way, this is very Italian thinking, too, because Italians like food with pedigree. That's right. what's important to them. They want to know where it's come from, how it's grown, how it's made, what, you know, so there's a, there's a connection. So two years ago, this, this switch went in my brain where I was like, okay, we've got to get really serious about what we're doing here. So I get my food from a community garden. I, I buy my share. And if something does well, everybody benefits. And if something doesn't do well that year, because it's quirky, um, we all share in the risk. Right. And I also have a, a sort of a co-op that I can order from. <clears throat> and sometimes I'll shop at a local market where there's local suppliers on maybe once every 12 weeks or when I'm looking for a party, um, I'll go to a, 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 a corporate store. Right. But co shopping in a corporate store, you're not, not, you're not going to find health there. I'm, I'm really, even the things that supposedly are organic, I just look at that and I go, I'm not sure about that now. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I think it might be the cleaner, the best of the bad. But, but I'm not convinced that but when you actually are getting things from a family who are also growing their own food right for what reason again it's it's they want something that's sustainable to the land develops community and supports the health of their family so so that is the foundation of health as far as I'm concerned you can do other things too but the quality of what you've got one of the reasons why I do sprouting and and my and the microgreens, this is I think is I think this is arugula. The thing about the the pasta is that I have a, a hot air popcorn popper. So at at the end of that, I end up with a pot of little green leaves. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I very carefully extract those out that was the dog you know <laughs> so what exactly what did, what did you put on your popcorn so i again i have this spray olive oil and i have celtic salt mm -hmm. and i have red star nutritional yeast okay and that's what i put on and my that's popcorn. what this is that's what this is so i'm just olive oil Celtic salt and nutritional yeast that's okay. it so the nutritional yeast is a bit cheesy so what's left in there it's, it's flavored. Right, right. A little different than, um, like you could use olive oil, Celtic salt, and nutritional yeast, and just make a slurry in the bottom of the bowl. Right. And somehow, it doesn't, it doesn't mm. taste the same. Interesting. It, it, there's something about the, the toasted corn flavor, it just, it's just different. So this is, so when I make popcorn, which is my go-to snack, <laughs> um, I don't do it a lot, but it's there for me. So it's you know. So how to keep from taking a dark path when you've got that mood <laughs> is that this is what I do. Right. And then I know that the next day I've got a I've got a flavor bill that I can use for something else. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. It works right there. So it's just a matter of very simply cooking cooking the the pasta, and then throwing it in that bowl and stirring it about. Nice. If you want to do something extracurricular, oh. you can. This is um, a bouillon cube, like half a bouillon mm -hmm. cube. This is a, does that look familiar? Oh, it's a bowl. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm going to do is really mash it up. And is that, what is that, a veggie one? I think so. Yeah, vegetable bouillon. Just a little something, something. I'm not going to use all of it, some of it. And this, I'm going to put. So that's maybe about a quarter, eh? Yeah, that's probably a quarter. That's only a half a little brick, so. And I'm going to put it in there, and then I'm going to give it a shot of olive oil. 
just so it kind of melts down. So by the time we throw something in there, it's a little softer. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because it's going to be pretty quick once I put the pasta in there. And I'm just using this to kind of mush it down a bit. I don't know why I've never thought of using a bouillon cube just on its own, like without it being in water. I don't know why that seems separate to me, that like you wouldn't just use it as a flavoring. Another way, I'm just gonna scoot in here because I showed you this already, is inside this is so little packet. So that little oil packet, I don't use that. I, I like fresh oils. But this little pack is just powdered flavor. Mm. So at times, if I'm cooking something, I will use this. And then it just ends up that I've got a little whack of, um, yeah. of noodles left over for another, another incarnation of this. And they're great, they're really great noodles. And sometimes I only use half the noodles. <laughs> so. I think being frugal is, is kind of built into my soul. One way to really keep um, herbs for a longer time in the fridge is that I have here like a little mini cold, cold frame, a little mini greenhouse, and down in here there's water, so it just sits nicely down in there. Mm. Okay. This is Italian parsley. Mm -hmm. So we've washed the parsley, and I'm just sopping up the water. The magic bag. In the magic bag, in the magic linen bag, works for me. Here I have basil microgreens. So where did you get those? Um, my community garden. Really? Yeah. If I had basil seed, I could grow them myself and they'd just be like this. I have garlic. And if we want, we could, like if I didn't have garlic, I would use this. Right. But I have fresh garlic. I'm probably using it. Now this is this is the secret ingredient. If you've got to use prefab food, right? Yeah. But now if you've got fresh tomatoes, you're going to use them. Right. But if you grill those tomatoes <coughs> and use them, they're awesome. So this is oh. fire roasted diced I tomatoes. Love those. Yeah. They're just again more flavor. But if you were to throw some fresh tomatoes on the barbecue and just blacken them a wee bit, that's what you'd use, and you'd, you could grill your sweet potatoes in the same way. Wow. And then just chop them up, throw them, like chop them coarsely, and then throw them in there. The thing is you want to build texture so that you're, you're going to pulse things in, but you're not really going to blend this to smithereens. It's just, just to break them down to a, a reasonable size. Right. Oh, right, right, whole, right. right? So, so now we're chop we've chopped up mm -hmm. the frozen mm -hmm. peppers. Mm -hmm. They're still frozen, eh? Like they're not really... Yeah, they're just defrosting. So a pretty handy thing to have. Again, I'm not going to rush out and get something. I'm not going to rush out on my bicycle and go and get something that I forgot. It's just that I'm going to work with what I have. So I also prep food in a way that allows me to have them at hand. So I've got frozen um, lemons mm -hmm. in, the, in the freezer. I've got How did you freeze ginger. them? I just cut them in quarters and threw them in a bag and threw them in there. Hmm. Um, I've got um, frozen plums, I've got uh, ginger, I've got some frozen garlic. You can in. freeze ginger? Mm -hmm. It's do actually you, really good. Do you freeze it whole or in chunks? Mm -hmm. No, I cut them in usable chunks because I only want them maybe an inch at, at a time. Right. And you bring them out and you don't have to fully defrost them. You just just let, let them sit there for a minute or two and then use the grater and they're, it's just as good as fresh. Wow. Mm -hmm. And just like in a bag or in a container? Or? Yeah, bag. Hmm. So this is basically just a, a roasted red pepper dip mix and a, a spice rim for Caesar drinks. So what's that? That's not actually what the bottle no, says. It's not, it's so not. tell me again what it is. Uh, a roasted red pepper dip mix from I don't know where. And um, this Caesar rim 
mix mix that I got at the health food store and really yeah so I just I just mixed both of them together and it kind of ended up being my I'm most entertained that there's a Caesar mix at the health food store personally but yeah and and a, a, a tomato clamato sort of like thing <laughs> That's there as so well awesome. I know I know how to make healthy Never healthy alcoholic drinks yeah, yeah. pure ingredients yeah Caesar's awesome. are, Caesar drinks are the one thing that I really don't like when there's alcohol in it. Mm. Really, it's like, mm, it's sort of like fish pop, so I don't... It's like what? Fish pop. I just don't like it. What is fish pop? Like pop, but it's fish flavored. <laughs> fish flavor. <laughs> I just don't like it. Oh, so, okay. So what are we doing? I'm using some of the, the, the garlic olive oil mixture. And I'm using some fresh as and well. And you put it right into the yeah, put it right mixer in there. there. None of this is fancy. Well, that was pretty fancy. I've never done that before. Okay. Um, so I'm going Your to definition use... of what's not fancy, it's really, I don't know. For me, I'm pretty entertained. All right. And so I'm going to throw in the parsley. And I'm just going to pulse all of that in together. Again, you kind of want things a bit chunky. You want some texture. I guess that's what I'm going to say. It Just will be, but not right. yet. So all I'm doing is pulsing that through. So theoretically, this would be like chopping it and then putting it in a bowl and just mixing it kind of idea if you didn't have this, yeah. like me, right now. Yeah. I'm going to take a storm break. Hey, cutie. How cute she is. Girl. She's so good. Okay, so you may want to just take a look at that texture. Oh my god, it looks so good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All I can smell is garlic and parsley. Mm -hmm. Epic. Pretty good beginning. Yeah. I like it when food actually smells like food. I'm going to throw these in too. I'm going to pulse them down a wee bit. Wow. There's really no wrong way because you're going for flavor. If you like something that's a puree, well, go for it. But really, you're just slightly chopping and mixing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do... Flavor is to be able to have, uh, like, do not just one note, but but have a, a, a harmonics. Mm. So you kind of think, okay, what's a high note? What's a low note? So tomatoes often need a base or more something more acidic to kind of balance it out. Tomatoes need something acidic, aren't they already mm. acidic? Yeah, but they, they just need a little something something. Like they're just they're they just kind of float in the middle. So what creates a, a depth of flavor, and how can you do that easily? So what I have here is a balsamic vinegar that's maple flavored. Mm. And I have a straight dark balsamic. And here I have a dark raspberry. So I'm just going to sniff through them and figure out what dark I Dark raspberry balsamic? Mm -hmm. oh. oh my gosh, that that's smells what's, amazing. That's, I'm, you know what I mean? That, yeah, that's yeah. Sort of like, mm, that just gives it a little something something. I can hardly smell it. This is different again. It's a, it's a bit sharper and it's a bit oh, sweeter. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going for the maple. Yeah, the maple yeah. seems right. It seems right. So I'm just going to take this way. And measurements are everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say probably... Probably I've got, I'm just going to put in a bit more. Probably that's a tablespoon. Okay. Or a scant tablespoon. And now I'm thinking about... Um, mm, I know what I've got. I could put in just basic olive oil. mushroom and sage 
coal pressed on oil. Oh, wow. I know. Oh, wow. Okay. So again, not lots, just maybe again about a, about a tablespoon. Maybe a bit more. So I'm just going to press that in. Now it's looking right. Brilliant. Oh, we're going to look at it. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. All right. Can't get over it. Now, because we were going to eat it fairly soon, that's why I went for the oil, the olive oil garlic combination. If I was going to let this sit for a couple of hours in the fridge, then, then the fresh garlic would mm. have a chance to kind of get around. So I just decided I'm going to do a little bit of a quick. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, because the stuff that's soaked in the olive oil has already sort of begun its releasing of the yeah. deliciousness. Okay. So the, then you start looking at this and saying, what else do you want in it? So I have Parmesan cheese here, but if you're going vegan, what I would use is the Red Star Nutritional Yeast. Because mm. it's got a cheesy taste, so there's another way of doing it. So the question is, did I want to pulse this in? These are, this is the basil this microgreens, is the basil, right? Or did I want to put it on top because it would be fun? So I'm kind of mm. going, I think I'm going to put that on top, and then I'm going to put one, one of these on top. Now, if you want, you can even put lemon zest on top. Oh, yeah. All right, so there's the... There's our options. And the other thing is that you can put in olives if you like olives. Oh. So what these are are herbed dried olives and they're still kind of, they're, they're moist and they're mushy and I just take them out and I cut them up with scissors. Oh wow. And so in that way you get, so it's just a kind of a, again, an easy thing to have on hand. And they're always there just in case and they're awesome. So the texture of them, they're kind of, you can press into them, they're not, they're not dry dry. And again, I think they have olive oil on them and some herbs. And, and that just stays in the fridge? Yeah, it stays in the fridge. And it kind of stays in the fridge forever. Really? Mm -hmm. okay. I've got another package here. So you can see where it looks like. Wow. I get that from a company called Organic Matters or Own Foods. Cool. Mm -hmm. Really good source of very good quality bulk foods. Nuts, seeds, nut butters, seed butters. Wow. Coconut oil. Hmm. Almost anything, anything. Okay. All right. What's that? Celtic salt. Okay. I'm stirring some of that in. What's the difference between Celtic salt and Himalayan salt? And is it something? Is it still sea salt? It's just a. I think ultimately all salt has been sea salt. Right. <laughs> so we live on we live on a salt bed. The idea that there might be salt in the Himalayas just keeps me awake at night. <laughs> The what? Egypt was only Egypt to the Greeks. The, the, the name Egypt. What do you mean? Well, you know how in Finland, it's not Finland, they're Swamalainen. Yeah. And Deutschland is Germany to us. Right. Well, the Egyptians didn't call themselves Egyptians. Only the Greeks did. Yeah, the Greeks called them Egyptians. So we think they're Egyptians. That's hilarious. I know. These are the things that keep you awake at night. So we talked a bit before we started about um, how to create flavor using essential oils mm. instead of. So this is a perfect opportunity to go, mm, what else might be good in there? So I have, and you want to make sure it's food grade, so no, sometimes it's a smattering of Latin really helps. So this is orange and lemon and they're both food grade. Uh, this is lime, and again, it's food grade cardamom. Oh, I love cardamom. Um, 
rosemary, lemongrass. So what I do is I wow. just put one drop into some carrier oil. Like you just, you don't want to use them full strength, but you want to flavor an existing oil. Oh, wow. So you dilute it down and you're not going to get caught putting some, too much of something in or having a blob of it somewhere that you're just getting at full strength. You don't want that. Um, this is the one I'm going to use. What's that? Um, I'll tell you. Oh. Uh, this is some spearmint, coriander, and this is cassia. Cinnamon isn't really cinnamon. We usually use cassia, where cinnamon is a bark and it actually tastes and smells really different. What we're using, as we call it, the cinnamon is actually cassia. Hmm. So this is uh, basil, orange, and bay leaf. Oh, wow. Now this was actually, I think, designed for babies with ear infections or something. Hmm. It's just so awesome. Oh, wow. And know that we're using basil. So we're using... Oh. If I wanted cool noodles, I would rinse that down in cold water. Right. But we don't. I don't. And into the into the leavings. And that is going to help uh, get, melt this uh, bouillon cube down a bit further. And I want to get mm. all of the flavor that's along the sides from the pup. You know, I didn't think I could eat popcorn because I, I realized I was getting an ache in the in the night in my small intestine, like not right away, but early in the morning. Like three in the morning, I'd have this ache, and I finally realized it was the popcorn. And I realized that if I used organic popcorn, that didn't happen. Oh. Again, you think of the inflammation. Right. You know, from I know that corn has a lot of dioxin and. Uh, when it's super Probably genetically like, modified, yeah, it's yeah, all whole, ground up ready corn. Now, rice pasta tends to be a little bit starchy, so if you don't like that, you know, this is kind of, mm -hmm. not gummy, but it's it's got some stick to it. And if you don't like that, then the reasonable thing to do would be to rinse it with hot water, keep it hot. Okay, and I'm so thankful because I asked Nelda if she could do something with her wheat because of course I'm on the cleanse and we're not having wheat and gluten so I it's... seldom have wheat um, most times I'm using other kinds of noodles mostly because they're just more interesting so I'm doing some lemon zest Ooh, nice zester that mm -hmm. is. got that in Texas like a million years ago and basil microgreens. Wow. Now, if we had Tim here, he'd really be doing some decoration. Mm -hmm. he's, really, he's really quite good at that. And rather than using a cheese product, I'm go there. Now, the other thing that you can do is just also put some more olive oil in with the noodle. Wow. I know. So that's going to be for you. So I'll do mine a little bit differently. Oh, just and some of this. Actually, I'm going to just less dry if you put a little bit of oil. Wow, what a nice grater. Holy mackerel. It's Wow, that's a game changer. Yeah. My son-in-law had one like this and I used it and 
So we went shopping in the big, 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 big store. <laughs> it felt like I was spending money like a drunken sailor. It was so good. And then here we've got our bits. Ta -da, ta -da. I dig the microgreens. Like, because even the way that you made them, It'd be so cool to talk. Actually, it's easy, right? Mm -hmm. Like how you did it? Because mm -hmm. it's different than sprouting. Mm -hmm. Well, only that you've got a little layer of dirt. Because you just basically took a, a takeout container. Yeah. Right? And I'm just going to turn for a second if we can see those greens there. See, there's a takeout container. Mm -hmm. So this is the tray that they're in. And there's a paper towel there, and I've made a, a slit on each side, and the paper towel gets fed down, so it's wicking. The water's in the bottom, so it's self, it's, it's constantly wicking. And then there's just a little wee layer of soil, and you really press the seeds down into the soil, and then I put a cap of, uh, of tinfoil on it, and really push it down, and that kind of deets it out. It thinks, oh, I have to really work to get up to the sunlight. So they really start pushing, and they literally will push the, the tin floor right up. Oh. When it gets to the point where they're beginning to fight their way up, then I put them in the window at night, and in the morning they're like, woohoo. Really? And then they grow like this, and then you, you just cut them off. That's amazing. I know. The thing is, like here, this is, like, it's almost, if, you'll, if you don't get them at the right spot, at the right timing, they'll start to fall over. Like they'll just exhaust mm. themselves because there's not enough nutrition mm -hmm. for them to do go any further like they can't really right the roots are always yeah they just they there isn't it isn't it's not like a real hydroponic but it's sort of like a baby hydroponic wow yeah. mm -hmm. extra greens extra greens you guys want to hear a funny story about tomatoes some of you guys might have heard it so did I ever tell you maybe I never told I'm sure I've told you this my favorite tomato story. There's no way you haven't heard it in 25 years. No. So, when I first married Wayne on the farm, they had a huge garden. Like, this garden was literally... Like, if you wanted to... If you drove up to the farm and you drove in the lane, you would... Let's say we're driving in the lane. We've turned onto the lane, so we're driving, 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 and we've parked. So that's how long the lane is. Right? I feel like... Okay, now I've got to diverge. So you ever heard of the the guy Ismo, the Finnish comedian who talks about ass being yeah, the funniest yeah. word? Funniest thing ever. If you ever look up Ismo, I-S-M-O, and ass, it's the funniest skit ever. But anyway, Ismo, I just saw him and he was talking about, you know, the weirdest thing about people in North America is we define uh, or we describe distance in terms of time. And he says, so I asked, and of course he's got this awesome Finnish accent and he's hilarious. So he says, so I asked this guy, he said, he said, you know, how far is the airport? And he says, oh, like 15 minutes. And he's like, so the airport is in another time? Like if I just <laughs> sit here and wait 15 minutes, the airport will arrive? <laughs> So that's what I was just yeah. doing there to explain the length of the driveway because I have no idea what it would be in feet or meters or something. Anyway, Wayne's mom on the farm had a garden from that point where I'm saying we'd park the cars all the way to the road and then about 30 feet wide. Monster garden. And of course, I'm from the city. So I'm like so po probably um, inspired but also super intimidated that these people are so earthy because I've always wanted to be super earthy. So of course I build this monster garden, not as big as hers. I made it half as big, which is still like the size of a property that a house should be on. Like it was so big. Anyway, I'd never really had a garden. Obviously I was 23 years old. And so, but we have, we're surrounded by Mennonites and Amish or Amish, I guess. And so one day, I go driving up to the Amish people 
to buy some tomato plants because obviously I thought they would be organic and it would be all good. So again, you drive up and their gardens are like acres and acres and acres because they grow all their own food. And there are multiple families in Montreal. And multiple families, right? And so now I'm feeling super intimidated. Like these guys are like epic humans and I'm just a dirty old city person or something. And so I go up to the lady and I'm like, oh, I'd like to buy some tomato plants. And she said, looks at me and she says, how many flats would you like? And I just looked at her and I was like, two? Well, <laughs> there's 48 tomato plants on a flat. <laughs> So, you haven't told me this story before. <laughs> what? It's new. Yeah. Just so you know. Wow. I've, I've heard a lot of stories, but this not this one. This is so. Great. I drive into the yard, and Wayne comes up, and he, I open the back of the hatchback, and he looks, and he's like, "Do you have any idea how many plants this is?" I'm like, "I'm not really sure, because they're little, right? How big can they get?" So, of course, out I go. And in I, my mind, I'm seeing the beginning of a horror movie. And, and, honestly, and, 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 honestly. No. <laughs> and, of course, so I go out and I plant my 96 <laughs> tomato plants. <laughs> 96 <laughs> tomato like plants. Ten, 10 tomato plants can take over the world. Oh, my God. And yeah. they were a combination. Oh. So there's two different kinds of t tomato plants. There's determinate and <laughs> indeterminate. And the determinate ones are kind of that you can grow up and they kind of stay in a cage. And the indeterminate have like, have feelers that go out into the world and do stuff, right? Well, it was basically a combination of indeterminate and determinate tomato plants. And so this garden was hilarious. You know another way of putting it? Tomatoes that obey rules and tomatoes that exactly. have no rules. And who do whatever they want. Yeah. Well... The hardest thing about gardening when you have a dairy farm is you're all gung-ho in the spring because you've been locked inside. It's been cold. You've been out. It's just brutal, right, all winter. So you have great dreams of, of gardens. So I have this great big garden, plant the garden, plant my 96 tomato plants, and a gazillion other things, right? I ordered every kind of squash imaginable, every kind of sunflower imaginable, planted every single seed. Like, I, I'm a nut job. And so then... The hard thing is the first crop we take off in the in the, in our dairy farm is the first hay. And the first hay comes off like the beginning of July. And basically, you just work flat out doing hay. Right? You just do hay for, you know. Well, in this time, the the reason it's excellent for hay is cuz it's hot and it's sunny and this well, this is when the, good for tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is when the garden also grows mm -hmm. and the weeds. Yeah. So, of course, you completely lose control of your garden 100%. So by the time we're done haying, I wander out to my poor garden, and these tomatoes have created a jungle. And then there's pigweed growing three feet tall that has stems on it like this. And the tomatoes are all interwoven in the pigweed and the lamb's quarters through the whole garden. It was the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. I had so many. That's, what I, that's the year I learned how to can. I froze tomatoes. I made tomato juice. I made I made everything. I know. Yeah, it well, was crazy. Those quarters are edible. Are they? Mm -hmm. Wow. Just like poor man's spinach. Really? Mm hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the war in Britain, Second World War, they had uh, there was something called the Victory Garden which was what would feed your family. And they had it all mathematically worked out so that if you were a family of three, you needed to plant this much. Your garden mm. needed to be this size, you needed to plant it. So exactly how much you needed to survive for a year for one family, and they had it all. So everybody that had an inch of soil was growing food. And, and in all honesty, the, what's going through my mind lately, especially this year, is we need to be thinking in terms of victory gardens. We, wow. we really need to think, okay, if, 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 can we trust the corporations to meet our needs? Right. Even with a bad attitude or, right. e you know, evil intent. Can we really trust them to keep us alive for a year? Hmm. And people have made, in the cities, 
in the States have been going to shop and the food's gone, like there isn't any there in the produce, right? It's just empty. So you kind of think, okay, if what if? If the if the if we can't get a steady supply of some some some, then what are we going to do? Which got me sprouting and then it got me doing microgreens and got your sister doing hydroponics in her basement. Oh my gosh. You should see the videos. Oh, it's insane. I, yeah, she's see, like this is baby hydroponic, mm -hmm. but there isn't any nutrition. Like it's not, it's not aerated. It doesn't have the 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 nutrition in the water to keep it going. But this is baby hydroponics. This is the first step. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fascinating because even to grow squash or to grow onions and stuff that keep like to mm -hmm. actually grow something that will keep in a cold cellar or something mm -hmm. like that. Like yeah. And how do you keep them in? Like, how do you build a cold cellar? What does it require? What's the humidity that's needed to keep a carrot going? Uh, what, 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 what? Or is there a way of creating cold frames so that you can use the heat of your house to keep it moderate? And then you've got a layer of straw, and the carrots are still growing in February underneath that. Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot. I mean, it's quite a, it's quite a science, and yet, it, it, it can be done. We just have to think about things differently. Hmm. You know, it's funny, years ago, so it was right after I was sick, like in the year 2000, um, Wayne and I actually were going to sell the farm, and because Wayne kind of was, like after watching me, you know, kind of come close to death and, uh, you know, difficult, and my mom had died and all that, he kind of had this moment on the farm, because we worked really hard on the farm, like it was just like 16, 17 hour days every single day. And just watching everything that was he, you know, what was happening, he just thought, wow, life is too short. Like, there's got to be an easier way to put food on the table. Sorry. So we actually put the farm for sale, and we were gonna learn. We we were gonna sell the house. We were gonna sell the farm and build. We even took a course in how to make straw mm -hmm. bale houses, <clears throat> and we were learning about how to make cold cellars and how to do all that because there was this deep desire inside of me about living off the land. And it wasn't, you know, yeah, it was an idealist thing, but it was deeper than that. Like it was like, a, no, this feels, there's something about being in tune with nature. There's something about being connected to the earth and, and nourishing her back and eating and having this beautiful connection. So we looked into all kinds of this and how to build a house that was off grid, how to use a centralized um, fireplace that you could cook on, you could heat, you could dry your clothes, everything. Like it was so interesting. So it's so interesting that, you know, 23 years later, you know, all this stuff has gone on in the world. We're questioning all these things. And what's happening is we're actually being forced back to that. We're actually being yeah. forced to say, we need to connect to the earth. Like it looks like, Oh, well, it's the corporate thing driving it. But I often think, you know, it's that whole thing that, okay, maybe there's bad guys and there's good guys, but what if it's really all for our best interest? Because we really need to get back to nature. We need to stop getting our head in this whole corporate technology world and actually build a, 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 a root cellar and eat out of our own thing and not be shipping in mangoes from across the world mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a great or benefit here. Or sending our recycles off to China, Indonesia, and, yeah. uh, and they sort it, and then they send it back on another ship. Mm -hmm. And shipping, oh, you know, shipping our plastic container somewhere else, like it just it doesn't make sense. Like we do, there's other ways of thinking through it, and there's better ways. I don't, I don't feel like it's going back to anything. I think it's going forward to something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Using those so. using those old older sciences because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's so cool to think about not just self reliance, but again, self reliance brings us back to the connection with the earth, right? And and then we actually start living in natural cycles again. Eating in the season, if you have if you're working, say eating within say a you know even a two three hour radius. That mm. the, all of the food coming into my home is from my locality. <laughs> Again, you use the time thing. Hilarious. Some people say like the hundred mile rule. Well, I don't know how like many that. miles it is. And I don't know how many kilometers it is, so we're just going to stop there. But I know it takes about two and a half hours to drive it. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, this is a huge resource. Like we're in a food um, producing, food industry part of the world, mm-hmm. and so it just just means that you're going to always work with what's in season. Now today we didn't. I went to uh, and now you can get hot house tomatoes, but again they're not of the field. So hence I have I get I get these. Um, no, but these can be the same as by the case. You know, I, I have I'll have a case of them and I'll have those tucked away and I'm always able to have mm-hmm. a meal when I want it. Well, we're supporting somebody who canned them. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they were canned in season. Well, that's what's interesting. Like I I read something once and they were saying how sometimes frozen food and canned food is actually better especially in the off season because they're canned ripe. That's right. You know, as opposed to even something like say a mango. If if it's shipped here from far away, it was picked unripe, sprayed with something to ripen blah blah blah. But if it's actually picked locally, processed, frozen and then shipped, you know, it's so much better for you because at least it's ripe when it was packaged, right? But yeah, I used to love when on the farm when I had because I used to can all kinds of stuff like I was such a back to the earth or like and to go down into the cellar and just to see these lines of, of jars of mason jars filled with food and mm-hmm. relishes and peaches and applesauce and like it was but great to, but to be realistic the, the, the garden was the easiest part of that equation in terms of mm. work so when I was, I wasn't gardening, but I lived with a family that did, and they had a huge garden, and, and it has, that was their food supply, they, that they counted on it. And um, every day the husband would go out, and he'd come back with a bushel basket full of, well, this was, it was bean season. And so every night when we got home from work, we had to sit there and nip them and cut them and can them and boil them. It was night after night after night, Oh yeah. Night out, and I remember once saying, "Okay, is is this the night we sleep?" <laughs> and and we did. We made, we canned fifty six quarts of beans. Wow. And and so that we would have beans once a week for fifty two weeks. With Until a few it was extras. bean season again. Mm. And then we'd have a couple of extra. Wow. What if we wanted to share it with somebody or whatever? So you kind of, you look at that and you go, yeah. And then and then there was the peas, and then there was the tomatoes, and then there was this, and there's that. Like, you know, when when it when the food's coming, you you. you it, it's a, it's a daunting task, and then to make something that's got, you know, that's a recipe, and you you got to mix up a batch mm. of whatever you're making relish or this or that. And then I, there was one point where we ran out of water, and it was time to work with the beets. <laughs> and it, I mean, it looked like a Stephen King, you know, like somebody was killed in this kitchen. Wow. There wasn't a darn thing we could do about it. We just had to get water from the neighbor and process away. I remember one time I was making applesauce, because we had apple trees on the farm. And so I went out and picked all these apples. And of course, my kids were very small. We were very isolated. Wayne was out in the barn. It was just just me. And I sat there and I peeled and chopped apples for hours and hours and hours. And then I cooked them down and I pureed them and I canned them and bulk. Like it just, it was the most endless job. And I was all by myself, right? Because I had no family around or anything. And I don't know how many jars I did. Maybe I did 30 jars or something, which was just an ex- extraordinary amount. But it took me I can't even tell you, like 12 hours or something. Like it was like so much work. Mm-hmm. And then that Sunday we were up at his mom and dad's and I said, I said, wow, I cooked applesauce. I said, what a f- huge job. Like it was just like literally you're slaving away in the kitchen. Like it was just, it's just really something. And she said, oh yeah, I sure loved making applesauce. That was one of my favorite things. I We would bring the bush, bushels in and then dad and all the kids would sit and peel and chop all the apples and there were four kids and I was like Mm -hmm. you had five people helping you yeah (laughs) and I just went oh see in some families having children is a resource totally but the thing is though like but it would have been happy like if I had done that with my kids my kids were too small at the time that would have just been part of our world right Mm -hmm. and because we're all eating it it's all part of what we did but I just didn't know 
-hmm. You know, I didn't know that this you could call friends in and then split it after. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't have that kind of community, but yeah. We could have that kind of community. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what have you got? What what's your resource? What's your knowledge? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine having going into a community and you have to give a um, a resume, you know, what's your yeah, what's your bio? And, and the most important thing are your skills and your hobbies. And mostly your hobbies. Like what's what's really going to enrich the community is what you do that you're passionate about. Totally. I like that idea. Totally. I think we could do a lot better. I think it's exciting. I think there's something really, really powerful about being able to do that and just Yeah. Just having everything you want at your fingertips and just yeah. making it happen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was really good. This was delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Noah.